and taught something we have learned. Now, Balak, king of Moab, uh, the story that unfolds just seems to strike me a little odd. You, Adam Sunday, mentioned the fact that we get this text and we go, why is it even in the Torah? Now, what's the purpose of this sort of hiccup where uh, a prophet uh, of the nations comes in, uh, I call him a for-profit prophet, comes in to do his thing and whizzes out, gets out, and nothing ever really happens. Then you have the story of Zimri at the end, which is a little embarrassing, kind of weird and embarrassing, uncomfortable. But what do we learn about the whole thing? So I, I titled this, The Lesson on ba uh, Balak Balaam and the God of Israel. Now, when Israel came into uh, the area, the king of Moab did not fear Israel. Why? Think about this. He didn't fear that they were going to attack him. Why was he not fearful of that? Because he already knew they had bypassed them. They already told him, we just want to come through. We want to take the king's highway. Legally, according to the laws of the land at the time, they could have easily taken the king's highway and no big deal. So he already knew that somehow this, this, um, uh, this idea of them coming in to attack them was canceled by the creator, by, by their God. And um, he still had an issue. But they have a deep connection. What is the connection of the Moabites, the Moabites Edomites, um, and how are they all connected with Israel? Help me here. Through through Lot, right? Esau. Esau, right? So they are actually descendants of Esau and Lot. There's there is one midrash that says that that Balaam is actually. Levan. Have you heard this? No? Yes. That Balaam is actually Levan. Now that would make him 400 some odd years old, which is a little odd. But there's also another Midrash that says that, that Balaam actually was tr trained in the arts of, of, of magic and, and mystical ideas from Levan. And he already knew uh, about Israel's origin when um, Iksak came and was there with Levant. Now, the reason why that text, uh, this, this is mentioned, is that in chapter 32, verse 9, he says this. This is Balaam. First, verse 8, he says, how can I curse? God has not cursed. How can I, uh, how can I anger? Hashem is not angry. And then he says, from its origins, I see it rock-like, and from hills I see it. Behold, it is a nation that will dwell in solitude and not be reckoned among the nations. What is he saying? Well, the sages of blessed memory said that this is where, why they believe that he was Levon himself, because he actually saw them in the beginning of their origins. One way or another, Belam is not a newcomer. He didn't just fall off of the pagan bandwagon. He knew what was going on. He understood what was going on. And I would further say the uh, Edomites, the Moabites, uh, the Amorites, Ammonites, all knew what was happening. They all had a history with Israel. They understood that they were in Egypt. And somehow these small little nations, uh, king of Moab, was a newcomer on the scene. It was a very small nation. So the idea is that these people went into Egypt at, with 70 people, and they come out with hundreds of thousands of people. And it's a bit intimidating. But Balak's fear wasn't that Israel was going to go to war with him. What was his fear? In Numbers 24.4, he says this, This horde will lick clean all that is about us as an ox licks the grass in the field. He did not fear Israel, uh, that Israel would take over Moab itself. Rather, he feared that they would take over the surrounding area. This is why we have the shepherding motifs that happen in the text. He says, as an ox looks up the grass of the field, he was concerned that because uh, that the, the Israelites are more, uh, what do you call it, more um, uh, husbandry and shepherds and sheep, that was their sort of uh, life in Egypt before slavery. Uh, that they would eat up all the grasslands and they would not be able to survive. The king of Moab told his elders of Midian because of this uh, symbiosis uh, between 
the agriculture land of Moab and the shepherd's tribe, that it was going to be important that they try to find some way to defeat him. The Lord God of Israel had prevented his people from attacking Moab. Why did he, did not, why he, why did he say that he did, didn't want them attacked? Remember? Because they are, we are family. Relatives. Right. That's why they didn't attack them. No Moabites, too bad they didn't treat them the same way. Because they would have, this thing wouldn't have not kicked off anyway, uh, as, as bad as it did. But what I find interesting is the whole story is going to unfold, and when we get down to it, we're going to discover why. Hashem was attempting to show something about the special relationship he has with his people. He wanted to demonstrate this special relationship. The Lord God of Israel had to prevent prevented his people from attacking Moab, but he had not precluded the possibility that Israel harm Moab by ser uh, serving it from its surroundings. So, in essence, he could have, they could have licked up the land, but he didn't ask them to do it. In order to overcome this threat, a force was needed to counter the Lord, to counter the uh, mighty deity who had already shown his power to defend Israel, both in Egypt and in the wilderness, who possessed such counter strength. Possibly the answer was to summon the master magician Balaam from the city of Pethor on the Euphrates, from the land between the two rivers, basically the Mesopotamian area. The leader in magic in the ancient world, according to pagan logic, the presence of many gods necessary means that the strength of any particular one is limited. Gods, too, are subject to fate. An expert magician can have an influence on them. So they're thinking, wow, they only have one god. Israel has one god. We have somebody that has many gods. Maybe he can conjure something up and, and develop a way to defeat Israel. The question is, is did Balaam feel the, fear the Lord? It seems that he, at some level, respected Hashem because he was very clear, I can't do anything that he doesn't tell me. So it's like a knowledge of Hashem. Has a knowledge of Hashem. Now, a lot of people that come out of Avodah uh, we have we have become quite familiar with those people who uh, uh, practice in other religious circles uh, what they call prophetic gifts, which later we identify as pathetic gifts, <laughs> right? But they have some knowledge of God. The, the Ramchal says that Hashem does raise up prophets in the nations, but he only gives them enough information so that people can, so that he can help the people of the nations, but he doesn't give them the big picture. So often, they have to fill in the blanks. They have to add stuff to it. And we're going to see Balaam actually do the same thing. When he gets ready to do a prophecy, or like a curse, whatever, he, he builds himself up. He used this great language of where he's from and who he is. and He's just building himself up, and then he gives this blessing and curse. We'll see in a second. After all, Balaam knew the God's will and that his blessed people uh, uh, not to be cursed and certainly not to be cursed in the name of Hashem. Nevertheless, Balaam attempted to achieve profession, uh, professional success in his work as a magician, success that would bring both prestige and monetary reward. Now, the confusion, I think, did you mention this Sunday that, that the confusion of don't go, go, don't go from Hashem to Balaam? No. You, you didn't mention this? No. The idea that he says, you, you are not to go, and then, he, then later he says, then go, if it benefits you. What does it mean? What, what, how did, what kind of permission is he getting from the Creator? He's basically saying, if this is your parnasah, it's how you make your money, go knock yourself out, but don't curse him. So that's the reason. It wasn't because God was confused. Merely a man has to have his wages and take care of himself. But he knew that the guy had enough integrity to listen to him. Let's look at uh, Numbers 22.18. He says, In a former level, Balaam obeyed the Lord's command and even subordinated himself to him for the moment, calling him the Lord my God. He claimed that this is his God. For only in this way, according to Balaam's pagan, pagan reasoning, could he maintain communication with the God of Israel and thereby should be favored with good fortune, perhaps through magic, bend the fundamental will of God of Israel. Now, on the other hand, 
Balaam knew that his powers, uh, that, that his powers, those of an expert magician, are limited. His magic was subordinate to the force of supreme fate. There was no assurance that he would succeed, especially in confronting a god as mighty as the god of Israel. Therefore, Balaam protected himself on the outset, repeatedly saying to Balak's, uh, uh, Balak's emissaries, after and later to Balak himself, he says this, Numbers 22, 38, he says, I can utter only the word that God puts in my mouth. So, we see as the curses are not working, or the blessings or whatever are not working, as a story unfolds, Balaam comes to understand that he was not able to bend Hashem's will Nevertheless, he tra trails after his employer, Balak, to build altars. How many altars were there? Remember? Seven, Seven altars. And there's actually, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, an understanding in the Zohar that talks about there was uh, some special power in the seven altars that were built. And so he was thinking, well, I, I, I'll just use the, the, what do you call it, the mystical levels of, of things that have been in the history of Abraham's people, and maybe I can conjure this up as well. 42 offerings, 42 right. And what is, you know what the 42 offerings tend to? Not right okay. Uh, okay, but alas, all has no avail, as Balaam asked Balak, but I told you whatever the Lord says I must do. Numbers 23, 26. Having understood what motivated Balak and Balaam, we still must ask why the Holy One, blessed be He, played along with this whole just farce. It was just seemed to be a game. Why did Hashem reveal Himself to Balaam? Why did He not sir, sever all contact with the pagan magician? Why? Why play along with this whole game? Why not just have a lightning bolt come out of the sky and, you know, cr crisp him up nice on the mountainside? Perhaps the Lord did this to show his might in comparison with the deception of magic in order to teach that which is self-evident to us today but to the pagan world of the time wouldn't have known the difference unless Hashem showed them that there is no power in pagan deities. What does the story actually teach? And this is, this is the apex of where we're going. Apparently there's another theological point to the story. Another reason for the seeming participation of the Holy One, blessed be He, in the game to bless Israel, reading Exodus and Numbers, as well as Moses' admonishments in, in Deuteronomy, gives the impression that the Israelites were taken out of Egypt, were a nation of sinners and complainers. That's sort of the thing you hear. I mean, after over and over you think there were just a bunch of horrible sinners and complainers. One could, however take a different perspective, bearing in mind that these events occurred over the course of 40 years. You know, we're reading the text. We see 40 years condensed in a few pages, and we go, what? what a messed up group of people they are. But can you imagine if somebody took the course of our 40, 50 years and compressed it down to a few pages? They wouldn't be thinking very kindly of us. At some level, just before they're to enter into the land, the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says, I want to stand my people up against the light. And I want the world to see what they are and who they are. And this is what I got. It says, there's an element to the count. It says, I accounted to you, your, I accounted to your favor the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in the land not shown. As the prophet Jeremiah says in hindsight, Jeremiah 2.2. 2. In the generation of the wilderness, when Moses repeatedly reproves the people, it is fitting for the praise of Israel to be voiced precisely by an outside figure, not one from Israel. Israel needed to hear somebody that hated them to say, there, I found no guile in the tent of Jacob. It's amazing. We, we are actually, I think, living in the generation in which we're going to see this change right before our eyes. We're going to see people in the nations begin that want to curse Israel, but it, it's going to become impossible. When I saw the Indian Prime Minister, I don't know if you, did you guys see this? Coming down the steps of his aircraft, he ran into the arms of Bibi Netanyahu, was, gave him a big hug, 
And it was this emotional, passionate hug and laughter. He was giddy beside himself to, to, to be with the prime minister. We have to remember that, that uh, the Indian prime minister, uh, the, Indian, the, in, the, the India, the country, helped to liberate Jerusalem way back when. They've had a very special relationship. But I think that what we're going to see is, as redemption draws closer, we're going to see people that even would want to curse them can't do it. And Hashem's going to show his people once again how special and unique they are and the special relationship they have. A stranger setting out with fundamentally hostile intent is the one to sing the name of the Lord's praise of Israel in wilderness. May Hashem in his day, in this day, do the same thing again. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we saw some person who's had a vitriol, maybe Iran, Iran's uh, leader, stand up to curse Israel, and we're going to destroy you, and they say the opposite. His praise regarding the present would uh, later be complimented by Moses close to his death. And the blessing for the future in Canaan, appeared in Parshat's uh, Vizot Ha-Baracha in Deuteronomy 34. What Balak failed to understand was ultimately understood by Balaam that the Lord God of Israel is indeed unlike any of the other gods of the pagan pantheon. He is not influenced by magic. Rather, and this is the most beautiful thing, he's influenced by his attitude toward his people and their attitude toward him. What influences the Creator? As mitzvah, they had no idea of this. this was pagan ideas had no concept of the attitude that Hashem draws close to His people and hears their 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 cry is because of the purity of their heart. He wanted to point out these are not a sinful, rebellious people. That's how you look at it, but they're not. He's not influenced by magic, and it says here in Numbers twenty four five. I mentioned this before. How fair are your tents, O Jacob? This is the precondition for like palms grow that stretch out like gardens beside a river. They crouch, they lie down like a lion, like the king of beasts who dare to rouse them. Numbers 24, 6 through 10. That little, little quote that I just gave, uh, Balaam is saying this is their relationship with God. They're like gardens beside a river. I mean, how prosperous is that? They are, they are like palm grows that stretch out. They crouch, they lie down like a lion, and like the king of the beasts. Who dare rouse them? Like who would dare wake up a sleeping tiger? Now it seems that Balaam, after, after being fired, was sent packing by Balak and having been disappointed the ruler, continued to maintain his relationship with Balak's partners, the elders of Midian. What did the elders of Midian come to ask him to do? Can you help us out? Is there any way you can help us defeat him? There's got to be some Achilles heel. What was the Achilles heel? Idolatry. Idolatry. So once again, Balaam realized something. Oh, their God cannot be motivated or moved by magic and potions and incantations. But he can be moved and change his attitude toward his people based on something that they would do wrong. So if you want them to do something, then attempt to get them to commit idolatrous behavior, and then he will destroy them. Well, that's, we know that how the story actually ends, right? They do end up uh, committing idolatry. For the 24,000 that did, they were, um, uh, they didn't see it as idolatry, did they? What did they see it as? A relationship. Having fun. Eating some meals, celebrating, having a party. Good times. It's not a big deal. New girlfriends. New girlfriends. Yeah, they're good, good. You know, I mean, Moses had a girlfriend like that. Moses had a Moabite, a Midianite, right? So if Moses can have that, then why can't I? But what they didn't realize is what was required of them to have that relationship cause them to break the fundamental commandment that God says to not make any graven image, not to bow down to it, not to make one that is in the earth, under the earth, in the heavens, etc., etc. 
And so we understand that Zimri's violence toward this woman and in-your-face sort of attitude to, toward Moshe created an environment that devastated Israel at the time. But the idolatry, the, it's interesting, the harlotry was less of a problem than idolatry. Why? Because idolatry is actually cheating on the creator of the universe. It's on the top of the list. It's the top of the list. There's only, what, two? Two commandments that brings death. Three. Idolatry, help me. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Murder. No, you forget, no. Violating Shabbat. That's a death penalty. No, probably so. Okay, so with that being said, what is the lessons that we learn from this? Is that God during this period of time, right before Israel was to go into the land that flows with milk and honey, right before, right after they spent a period of time complaining because they were sick of the manna and they wanted something new, they wanted a little bit of spice in their life. After all the complaining, after the serpents bit them, they did chuva, repented. Hashem still says, they're the apple of my eye. They're still special to me. And that I am the one true God. And that anybody who wants to have a relationship with me has to have a relationship based on his parameters, not our parameters. We don't get to call out the parameters. We cannot make another religion. It's one of the things that we fight all the time within people uh, that are coming into the B'nai Noach, uh, you know, area of influence, is to help them to understand that we do not have a B'nai Noach religion. It cannot be. It is Judaism. It is Judaism for the non-Jew. That's what this is. And anybody who attempts to do this is actually producing an environment of idolatry for the B'nai Noach. Um, may Hashem cause His Torah to be magnified. May we also see the special relationship that we have with the Creator. Because His relationship with us is based on the same parameter. He deals with us on the same way that we deal with Him. And I'll leave with these final words. He says, as a warning to Israel before they went into the land, He says, if you treat me with casual, this casualness, or ca with, you know, casual, being casual, then I will treat you casually. If you treat me with zeal, then I will have a relationship of zeal with you. And this is the reason why that we want to fan the flames of zeal with people in the world, in the nations. We want to encourage people to be zealous for God. And I'm not talking about zealous like a warrior. I'm talking about having great zeal and yearning for the creator of the universe. Any person can do this, whether you're a young man, a young woman, an older man, 55 years old, it doesn't matter. If you begin to yearn for God, then God will draw close to you. All we have to do is make the little hole, just a little tiny prick in the veil, and Hashem will do the rest. May Hashem draw you close to Him, and may He reward you with your study. Amen. That concludes.